NBC News, straightforward. Tense moments in the Capitol today after a scare during today's dress rehearsal for the inauguration. A fire in a nearby homeless camp forced an evacuation in some parts of the building and a lockdown in others. A reflection of the heightened anxiety in the nation's capital. Newly released video from The New Yorker shows some outrageous scenes of the pro-Trump mob attacking the Capitol building, threatening police, telling them to stand down, hunting party leaders with terroristic threats. The FBI now guarding against a possible insider attack, vetting up to 25,000 National Guard troops being deployed in D.C. And charges for a woman accused of stealing Speaker Pelosi's laptop and trying to sell it to the Russians. President Trump spending his final hours isolated in the White House. Will he pardon himself and his family before leaving office? Meanwhile, President-elect Biden taking part in a national day of service today while his team put forth ambitious plans for his first 100 days in office. The pandemic reaches yet another milestone of overwhelming loss. 400,000 American lives taken. The CDC now projects will reach half a million deaths in the next month. And word now that the largest vaccination site in the country, Dodger Stadium, will run out of doses by Wednesday. One of the world's worst humanitarian disasters is getting worse. Millions in Yemen are starving or close to it. And now many aid groups might not be allowed to help feed the hungry. Why the U.S. is being blamed for making it even worse. A closer look at the government-funded program meant to provide relief to small businesses. But many, especially minority-owned companies, have been getting shut out, while some megachurches have been able to receive the funds. And honoring a national icon, Martin Luther King III joins us to talk about the legacy of his father and why Dr. King's message still resonates today. But we got to learn how to be more civil as a society. We've got to learn how to turn to each other and stop turning on each other. Words of wisdom there. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us, and happy Martin Luther King Jr. Day. In Dr. King's final sermon the night before he was assassinated, he reflected on how he had almost died 10 years earlier when a deranged woman stabbed him. King said if he had sneezed at any point before he got medical attention, he likely would not have made it. And on that April night, Dr. King stated that he was at peace with what the civil rights movement had accomplished in that past 10 years, saying that he'd been to the mountaintop and seen the promised land. Some have referenced what will take place this Wednesday as a mountaintop moment when Kamala Harris completes a climb that no other American woman has achieved and takes place as vice president. Tonight, the MLK Memorial is eerily quiet, shut down since domestic terrorists stormed the Capitol. And in that final sermon, Dr. King also warned that the world is all messed up. The nation is sick. Trouble is in the land. Confusion all around. The current health of this nation in that figurative sense will be judged by history. But in a literal sense, this nation is ailing on the brink of the grim milestone of 400,000 Americans dead from COVID. At the same time, 25,000 National Guard members are now in place to help ensure one of the hallmarks of our democracy, a peaceful transfer of power, is without incident on Inauguration Day. Our Martha Raddatz leads us off tonight with the push to secure the inauguration. Tonight, a city on edge, armed National Guard manning checkpoints and police boats patrolling the Potomac River. A false alarm today at the Capitol building after that all too real siege that prompted this lockdown. This surreal new video from New Yorker reporter Luke Mogelson tracking the mob of pro-Trump rioters climbing the scaffolding looking like a medieval battle. Once inside, emboldened, telling stunned officers that President Trump had sent them to do this. We're out there's a million of us out there, and we are listening to Trump. You're the boss. <laughs> and the chilling search for Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Inside the Senate chamber, insurrection. There's got to be something in here. 
For the first time, we see a lone Capitol police officer in the chambers. Okay, just want to let you guys know this is like the sacredest place. Uh -huh. I know, hey, no, I'm gonna take it. To, I'm gonna take it to the chair because my pants is a chair. The QAnon follower Jacob Chansley leaving that ominous message on Mike Pence's desk. It's only a matter of time. Justice is coming. It's only a matter of time. Justice is coming. And another newly released video shows a Capitol Police officer wearing a MAGA hat, begging rioters to help him get to the officers he says are trapped inside the Capitol. Oh, they can stay there. I just need to get the other officers out. The two men guide the officer into the Capitol building. Let them leave. The crowd letting the officers pass through safely. And with news that at least one off-duty National Guardsman has been arrested for storming the Capitol and other veterans part of the siege, all of the Guardsmen are being vetted for possible insider threats. The FBI is part of it, the Secret Service is part of it, and, and once they are uh, certain that the, there's no insider threat, then that uh, soldier, Guardsman or Airman, uh, is given a credential. Meanwhile, federal law enforcement continues to round up rioters. John Schaefer, an Indiana heavy metal musician, turning himself in Sunday. And Robert Gieswein, both men associated with extremist militia groups. A former acquaintance of Riley June Williams, authorities say that's her in the green T-shirt, told them Williams was trying to sell a computer taken from Nancy Pelosi's office to Russian intelligence. Authorities say she's still on the run. And Coy Griffin, a New Mexico County commissioner who leads the group Cowboys for Trump, promised in this meeting to return to D.C. with guns. I think I'm going to leave either tonight or tomorrow. Um, I've got a 357 Henry uh, big boy rifle lever action that I've got in the trunk of my car. The FBI says Griffin was indeed found blocks from the Capitol on Sunday with his guns. And Wesley Allen Beeler was arrested Friday with a gun in his truck at a security checkpoint. He was trying to get to work at a security job and forgot to leave his gun at home in Virginia. And Martha Brannis joins us now from Washington. Martha, despite that scare, the inauguration rehearsal still went on today. It, it sure did, Lindsay. Look, we're in the middle of Washington, D.C. We're surrounded by armed National Guards on the ground here. But up at the Capitol, that rehearsal did go on today, and several thousand military participated in their ceremonial duties for Wednesday. Lindsay? And Martha, hundreds of thousands of tips have come, been coming in and that are helping authorities try to identify the Capitol Hill rioters. And who's turning those tips in seems to be making some headlines as well. It's quite extraordinary, about 200,000 digital tips, and many, many of those came from family and friends of those who stormed the Capitol. They're turning them in. All right, Martha, thanks so much. As always, stay safe. President Trump will hold that title for just a day and a half longer, and in his final hours, the president is expected to issue more pardons. But ABC News has now learned that he's not expected to include himself or any Trump family or close associates on that list. And with Trump set to leave Washington Wednesday morning before Joe Biden is inaugurated, he is defying tradition and has yet to reach out to the president-elect. Here's our chief White House correspondent, Jonathan Carl. While President Trump was once again nowhere to be seen, First Lady Melania Trump today offered her farewell message to the nation. My fellow Americans. In the pre-recorded video, she seemed to allude to the attack on the U.S. Capitol by supporters of her husband. Be passionate in everything you do, but always remember that violence is never the answer and will never be justified. Use every opportunity to show consideration for another person. But Mrs. Trump will be the first first lady in modern history not to invite her successor to the White House before the inauguration, denying a courtesy to Dr. Jill Biden that Michelle Obama extended to her. Of course, President Trump isn't extending that courtesy to Joe Biden either. Some of Trump's advisors have been pleading with him to at least call Biden and to leave him a note in the Oval Office, a long-standing tradition of outgoing presidents. Shortly after taking office, Trump showed David the note Barack Obama left him. And this was the, the letter given to me by President Obama. 
We saw that image of him the final morning that he was here, mm -hmm. putting the letter on the desk. Which was, I won't show it to you, read it to you, but a, a, just a, uh, a beautiful letter. Is there a line beautiful you can letter. share that, that struck you most? There were numerous lines, so well written, so thoughtful. George H.W. Bush famously left Bill Clinton a note saying, quote, you will be our president when you read this note. Your success is now our country's success. I'm rooting hard for you. Trump is instead planning a farewell ceremony for himself at Joint Base Andrews with great military fanfare. Then he'll board Air Force One for the last time and head to Mar-a-Lago, where moving trucks were spotted today. Before he goes, Trump is expected to announce about 100 pardons. But sources tell ABC News the president is not expected to pardon himself or any members of his family or any close associates. And then there's the matter of his impeachment trial. Who will lead his defense is up in the air. It had been expected to be Rudy Giuliani. But Giuliani told ABC over the weekend that he's out because he, too, spoke at the rally before the riot. Let's have trial by combat. Giuliani says that makes him a potential witness. I'm willing to stay. Jonathan Carl joins us now from the White House. John, the president's been debating how to handle pardons in these final days. What in the end do we know could be driving that decision not to pardon himself or any of his family members or close associates? Well, regarding the pardon to himself, the president has been advised by White House lawyers, including the White House counsel, Pat Cipollone, that first of all, a self-pardon may not be constitutional, would be certainly be subject uh, to court challenge. Uh, but he has also argued, uh, Cipollone has, that if the president pardons himself, he could make himself more vulnerable to civil lawsuits because that self-pardon could be taken as an acknowledgement that he did something wrong and therefore needed to pardon himself. Uh, regarding family Family members. Uh, it, it's unclear, uh, but I can tell you that when he first got that news uh, that a pardon for himself could complicate uh, his own legal future, uh, the president was quite angry about it and had an attitude of, well, if I can't pardon myself, I'm not going to pardon uh, the others around me. We'll, we'll see, ultimately. And, and by the way, Lindsay, although we're, we're told right now not to expect a, par a pardon of himself or a pardon for family members, anything can change before noon on the 20th. Right. On Wednesday. So that's still potentially on the table. And you also had an interesting conversation with Rudy Giuliani this weekend. Tell us more about that and what's the latest that you're hearing on where the president's defense team and his potential impeachment strategy stands at this moment? Well, I had a couple conversations with Giuliani. The first, he said that he was working on the president's defense. He actually outlined for me uh, some of the legal strategy that he would be pursuing. And then uh, the next day, Sunday, uh, he said that he was no longer going to be on his defense uh, team. Giuliani said the reason for that was that because he spoke at that rally before the riot, before the president spoke, he could be a witness in the impeachment trial and couldn't be both the lead counsel uh, for the president or now the what soon to be former president president and a witness. Uh, but I can also tell you that after uh, our story ran about Giuliani's legal st uh, legal strategy, a lot of people close to the president were urging him uh, to drop Giuliani, saying that that was the wrong choice uh, to lead his defense. That said, uh, it's totally unclear now who will lead the defense. We've heard nothing about who the president will have uh, defending himself in the Senate trial. All right. We'll stand by for news on that. Jonathan Carl, thanks so much as always. Thanks, Lindsay. We turn now to President-elect Joe Biden, who, along with his wife and other family members, spent part of Martin Luther King Jr. Day volunteering at a Philadelphia food bank. The day of service comes with Biden now less than 48 hours away from taking the oath of office with plans for a fast-paced start for his administration to tackle the pandemic head-on, but also including dozens of planned executive orders. Here's ABC's Mary Bruce. As Washington prepares to usher in the Biden era with less than 48 hours to go, the president-elect is putting the finishing touches on his big speech. Sir, how's the speech ready going? Have you finished your speech? Biden spending this Martin Luther King holiday packing boxes at a food pantry in Wilmington with the soon-to-be First Lady Jill Biden. His team is laying out the plan for day one. Biden expected to sign roughly a dozen executive orders, undoing some of Donald Trump's most controversial moves. He will immediately rejoin the Paris Climate Accord, reportedly cancel the Keystone Pipeline, and will reverse the so-called Muslim travel ban and take the first step in his fight against COVID, mandating masks on federal lands and extending the pause of student loan payments. 
But Biden's big ticket items like that massive $1.9 trillion stimulus plan will require congressional approval. There is a lot to do. Some would say that ours is an ambitious goal, but we do believe with hard work and with the cooperation and collaboration of the members of the United States Congress that we can get it done. Kamala Harris will make history this week as the first black woman and the first Asian American sworn in as vice president. Administering the oath, Justice Sonia Sotomayor, the first woman of color on the Supreme Court. And it will happen on the same spot where that mob of Trump supporters stormed the Capitol. Harris today asked if she had any security concerns. I am very much looking forward to be sworn in as the next vice president of the United States, and I will walk there to that moment proudly with my head up and my shoulder back. The soon-to-be vice president has says that we cannot allow people to be afraid of who we are. Mary Bruce joins us now. Mary, with so much added security for Wednesday, this certainly will not be the traditional inaugural that we've seen historically. So what do we know about when the Bidens will arrive in Washington and beyond his oath and inaugural address? What does he have planned for, for the day to mark the occasion? Well, they will be arriving here, the president-elect and his wife, Jill Biden, tomorrow afternoon. Then, of course, they'll be spending the night at Blair House, as is the tradition. Of course, much of the pomp and circumstance of the inaugural morning has been canceled. There's no tea at the White House with the outgoing president, no joint limo ride up here to the Capitol. And then after the big inaugural address, of course, arguably the most consequential speech of Biden's life, normally then you head into the party, right? There's the big parade, the celebration, the packed walk to the White House, those fancy galas and balls. All of that is off the table. Uh, instead, Joe Biden will be visiting Arlington National Cemetery to, to lay a wreath and pay his respects. And there will be a short walk. I wouldn't call it a parade, call it parade-esque. He'll be walking down Pennsylvania Avenue. There will be some marching band, so, so not all the celebration is canceled, but a much uh, safer, smaller way of marking the moment. And then into the White House. And of course, we know that he wants to get straight to work. He's likely to sign uh, up to a dozen executive orders, even on Inauguration Day. And that evening, instead of you know, heading out and making the rounds, whipping around all of these parties in Washington. They're taking it virtual. Uh, there will be a big star studded event, but actually one, you know, for this time, all of America can join in, uh, even if you didn't get a coveted invitation, Lindsay. A bit of a concert there to celebrate. Mary Bruce, our thanks to you. Thank you. And now to the COVID-19 crisis as we reach yet another horrific milestone. 400,000 Americans dead from the disease, with the CDC now predicting that we could hit half a million lives lost next month. And this week marks a year from the first case reported in the U.S. Now the vaccine rollout hitting new roadblocks. ABC's Steve Osinsami reports from Atlanta. This week now marks a whole year since COVID-19 first appeared in this country when the president was saying the disease would be handled. We have it totally under control. It's one person coming in from China and we have it under control. It's uh, going to be just fine. But the new numbers tonight aren't fine. The number of Americans killed by the coronavirus is now nearly 400,000. And the CDC warns that another 100,000 could die in the next month. The disease is overwhelming funeral homes tonight in Los Angeles County. The cemeteries can't keep up. Manuel Lopez Marquez died last week, but his family says they might not be able to bury him for another month and a half. When we called the cemetery, um, we were 102 on the waiting line, and it took about six to seven hours to get through through this uh, the mortuary. In hard hit communities like this one in Yuma, Arizona, they're waiting on new supplies of the vaccine because they don't have enough dose for everyone who is eligible to get one. Pat Parker in Texas is one of the many who says she's desperate to get the shot. I don't want to die of COVID. It's that simple. I don't want to die of COVID. In California, they're working through a setback. More than 330,000 doses are on hold until health officials can figure out why a small number of people at a single vaccination center suffered possible allergic reactions after getting the shot. The risk, which is so small of a severe allergic reaction, particularly somebody who's never had a history, really is minute compared to the risk of just having COVID. Diana Canizzo says it could have been something else that caused her reaction and says she doesn't want other Americans to avoid the vaccine. I do have a lot of friends that have heard my story and still went and got their vaccine, and I think that's amazing.
Our thanks to Steve for that. And when we come back, it's like the movie The Terminal brought to life with a touch of 2021. Why one man decided to live in an airport for months. Why some are saying that the Trump administration could be making the world's worst humanitarian crisis even worse. But up next, while small business owners struggle to stay afloat, the growing criticism over the federal funds that went to some mega churches through the payment protection program. Stay with us. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change, well, like every day. So what is it that you really need to know, want to know, to help you not just get through your day, but make the most of it? Feel smarter, feel better, feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. It's all about you. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. This is going to be so good. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. What you're seeing right now, this is part of the eye wall. This procession of migrants goes back two miles. There is going to be catastrophic damage. This fire has made a run. You can see those flames shooting up into the sky. We are on the jam-packed red carpet. Let's do it right, guys. So this is the fourth weekend of protest. <laughs> Watch NBC News on location for Facebook Watch. Your mom said, comb your hair. Your dad told you, smarten up. Your dog is judging you right now. And your best friend just called you crazy. We all need someone who'll pull no punches and give it to us straight. Now imagine getting your news like that. No bull, no spin, just give it to me straight. Straightforward news, straight to the heart of the story. ABC News, straightforward. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. So if you like getting behind the biggest news stories of the day, inside all the details, the backstory, and what will happen next, then listen to Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. It's like no other news podcast out there. Even the critics agree. Listen free on Apple Podcasts. Welcome back. The Paycheck Protection Program aimed at providing relief to struggling small businesses has received much criticism throughout the pandemic for not helping those who need it most. And just today, the Washington Post reports five anti-vaccine groups received $850,000 in PPP loans. Some of the groups even had their social media accounts suspended for spreading misleading information, raising larger questions. If the government is helping people who are seeking to undermine its agenda, what about the actual businesses in desperate need? Our Faitha Bube reports. Navy veteran Teresa Black was first deployed just five months before her only child, Isabella, turned two years old. I literally cried every day. The separation made worse by her child's innocent words. When I left her, she really, at two years old, thought that I had dropped her off and moved to another house. And she told me that the first week I was gone. She's like, Mommy, can I come see you at your house? That's heartbreaking. Um, yeah, it was horrible. Now back from deployment, in December 2019, Teresa opened this Arlington Gelato shop as a way to anchor herself closer to her daughter. It means everything to me, honestly. Like, this is my way not to leave her again. But this past year, the reality of losing it all ever so real. The pandemic ravaged economy, threatening to take everything. So you were only making 10% of what you had been making pre-COVID? Oh, yeah, yeah. It was about 10%. It was about, it was about 10%. For the entire month of April, we made only one day's worth of sales. I saw everything crumbling. And then it was a question of, like, what now? 
Teresa got resourceful, seeking out grants and applying for a loan through the Paycheck Protection Program. The massive and unprecedented federal government program offers forgivable loans to small business owners, at the time companies with 500 employees or less, if they use it to stay open and keep employees on the payroll. But Teresa's bank? They didn't actually put out the applications. They put out the applications for the application. And after a painstaking process, Teresa was approved for only $2,000, not even enough to cover one month's rent. And in the end, a laundry list of issues keeping her from actually receiving a penny. I was furious. A lot of the money went to these larger small businesses, but all the micro businesses that actually needed the money that couldn't qualify for loans. It was crazy to me that I'm reading like this company got $2 million, this company got $10 million, this company got this many loans, like all their different um, arms of, of this company got this many loans and it's just like, is this a joke? Some of the nation's largest restaurant chains like Ruth's Chris and Potbelly Sandwiches are facing backlash, expected to receive millions from the payroll protection program, which is meant to help small businesses keep their employees. Newly released data from the Small Business Administration shows billions of dollars from the PPP went to the wealthy and well-connected. While minority small businesses waited longer, got less money or no money at all. It was really intended to be a lifeline for small businesses. However, there were, from the outset, you know, structural flaws with this program, structural barriers. Restaurant chains like Shake Shack, Ruth's Chris, and Potbelly coming under fire and have since returned all the money. PPP loans were also extended to groups that ordinarily wouldn't qualify through the Small Business Administration, like nonprofits. Critics are also calling out the federal government for giving more than $7 billion in the PPP loans to religious organizations, waiving its own rules to give them access to taxpayer dollars. Churches are employers. Churches are service providers. And when there's a struggling church who is also struggling because of the pandemic, because people can't go to the institution, their employees are also going to suffer if they can't pay them. But University of Virginia law professor Micah Schwartzman says it's not that simple. What marks out PPP as different than past funding programs is, um, is the direct financing of religious operations and religious institutions. We just hadn't seen something like that before. So it changes the landscape of how the federal government and state governments relate to religious organizations. Many are also outraged that mega churches, where pastors are sometimes worth millions of dollars, were able to qualify. I think the public perception is that some organizations that had financial means should not have taken the money, even if they were eligible for it. Data released by the Small Business Administration shows churches led by evangelical TV stars like Joel Osteen's Lakewood Church received $4.4 million. Joyce Myers Ministries getting $5 million through PPP. Paula White Kane's City of Destiny received $259,000. Robert Jeffers First Baptist Dallas, $2.2 million in tax dollars. Lakewood Church and Joyce Myers Ministries telling ABC News the money saved hundreds of jobs and the pastors did not personally take a penny. The other churches have not responded for comment. There was no opposition, no serious political or public opposition to uh, religious organizations being included in PPP like all other nonprofits. I think most people understand that these are very special circumstances during the pandemic. And so there wasn't any major public outcry about this. The reason why there's op more opposition and objection to megachurches receiving money is um, similar to why uh, there was opposition to large corporations receiving money. Reports now that just two weeks after being approved for $3.9 million in PPP funds, Daystar TV Church bought a private jet. According to Inside Edition, after their investigation, the church reportedly paid back all $3.9 million. ABC reached out but did not get a response. It's insane to me. It's just like another slap in the face, I think. With the government now issuing a new round of PPP, critics were watching hawkishly to see if any lessons were learned. The SBA hasn't responded to specific questions from ABC News, but said in a news release, it's, quote, calling upon its lending partners to redouble their efforts to assist eligible borrowers in underserved and disadvantaged communities. They've also set aside funds specifically for businesses with 10 or fewer employees. Teresa is already in line, trying to save her business. Are you feeling better about the second round? I mean, reality is that we can't write the rules. 
um, but we can try to demand something better. Um, I'm just hoping to get something that's going to help. Uh, because the reality is that um, we have to make it through the next at least few months. Our thanks to Faith for that and still ahead here on Prime. Some are calling it a sham trial in real time. Putin's fiercest critics are immediately detained upon returning to Russia. The growing concerns over children's screen time and the digital withdrawal to come. On this MLK Day, we take a look at the diversity of the new Congress by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day. How at least one athlete preparing for the Australian Open is handling quarantine. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live, the 24-7 streaming news source, ABC News. Breaking news, live events as they happen, streaming live, non-stop, straight to you. Original, on the edge, breakthrough storytelling from ABC News, National Geographic, ESPN, all designed differently for you to stream straight to any screen whenever you want, free. And imagine the most celebrated, epic live event and moments this is live. all playing out right before your eyes see those flames behind me and go deeper inside the groundbreaking exclusives from the campaign trail only abc news gets watch abc news live right now and anytime streaming on roku hulu facebook and abcnews.com abc news live streaming everywhere right to you abc news live here on the ground at the Iraq. 18,000 tons. Matatas. Ismail. Yes. David. David. Over ground zero from Hurricane Michael. You can see just home after home. David, thanks for meeting us. This was your view. My favorite view. Thank you for Thank you. mornings may look different these days, but where you start your day, where you spend your mornings, where you get connected to everything that's happening. And face it, there's a whole lot happening in our world these days. Where you get all the breaking new information of the day to help you navigate through these times. That's why we're here. Good morning, sunshine. And making sure you start your day off with a smile and some sunshine. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Oh, how I love saying that. Wake me up. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for Overall Excellence in Television. ABC News, America's number one news source. This is GMA3, what you need to know. GMA3. A third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon. It's all about you. Lunchtime on ABC. Welcome back, everyone. As we prepare to inaugurate a new president and vice president, we also take a look by the numbers at the makeup of the 117th U.S. Congress sworn in earlier this month. It's the most diverse in our nation's history. A record 144 women now serve in Congress and hold 27 percent of congressional seats. That's the highest in U.S. history. Of course, that's still well below the female share of the population. This includes 52 women of color, the most in our nation's history, and 38 Republican women also a record high. In fact, two-thirds of the newly elected female House members and half of the newly elected women of color are within the GOP party. 61 black Americans now serve in Congress with Reverend Raphael Warnock, the senior pastor at Ebenezer Baptist Church where Martin Luther King Jr. preached, making history as the first elected black Democratic senator from the South. There have only been 10 black senators in our nation's history, including Kamala Harris, who resigned her Senate seat today to become the first female, first black, and first South Asian American to serve as vice president of the United States. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime. The former Florida data COVID scientist arraigned in court. Did she illegally access the state's emergency health alert system, or is this a case of retaliation? could be one of President-elect Biden's biggest foreign policy challenges left by his predecessor. What to do about the humanitarian crisis in Yemen with so many starving? And honoring the message of Dr. Martin Luther King. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. Do you 
reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. So if you like getting behind the biggest news stories of the day, inside all the details, the backstory, and what will happen next, then listen to Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. It's like no other news podcast out there. Even the critics agree. Listen free on Apple Podcasts. Yes, mornings may look different these days, but where you start your day, where you spend your mornings, where you get connected to everything that's happening. And face it, there's a whole lot happening in our world these days. Where you get all the breaking new information of the day to help you navigate through these times. That's why we're here. Good morning, sunshine. And making sure you start your day off with a smile and some sunshine. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Oh, how I love saying that. Wake me up. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Friday nights, 9 8 Central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime. 2020. Friday nights, 9 8 Central on ABC. With nerves already on edge, a security alert Monday morning sending people running through the halls of Congress. Turns out it was a small fire at a homeless camp about a mile from the U.S. Capitol. But it was another sign of the tension inside the nation's capital after the deadly insurrection on January 6th. Disturbing video shot by the New Yorker revealing just how determined the rioters, who've been described as domestic terrorists, were. Got it. <laughs> The FBI has now arrested dozens of Trump supporters who stormed the Capitol just two days from President-elect Joe Biden taking his oath of office. Amid fears of a potential insider attack, the Army has been performing background checks on National Guard members involved in securing the Capitol. But everybody joining the military is screened in, and for an event like this, you're screened out. This week now marks a whole year since COVID-19 first appeared in this country. We have it totally under control. It's one person coming in from China, and we have it under control. It's uh, going to be just fine. The number of Americans killed by the coronavirus is now nearly 400,000. And the CDC warns that another 100,000 could die in the next month. Mass vaccination centers have popped up across the country, including Miami's Hard Rock Stadium and LA's Dodger Stadium. But officials warn doses there will likely run out by Wednesday. All those can be put in place, but they're useless unless they have something to, to administer. The government pushing for at least 50 million doses to be distributed by the end of January. So far, only about 31 million have gone. Former COVID data scientist Rebecca Jones left court after posting bail. She turned herself in after being accused of illegally accessing the state's emergency alert health system to contact current employees. She claims the whole thing is retaliation from Governor Ron DeSantis. Jones was fired after accusing state officials of suppressing COVID numbers. Last month, officials raided her home. She says police pointed guns at her and her children in the raid. Officers say otherwise. Crowds protesting the arrest of opposition leader Alexei Navalny. 
Putin's fiercest critic, Alexei Navalny, detained minutes after landing in Moscow last night. The moment live streamed by journalists, capturing Navalny's kiss farewell to his wife, Yulia. Bizarre images of a trial set inside a police station just outside Moscow. Navalny says Putin must be so scared of him to throw all legal procedure out the window. His lawyers only getting alerted minutes before. The judge putting him away for 30 days. A hearing over whether he should be jailed for longer officially starts next week. Navalny was arrested just after returning from Germany, where he had been recuperating after being poisoned by a nerve agent. A man from California claims he hid in a secure area of Chicago's O'Hare Airport for three months. Police now have charged Adita Singh with felony criminal trespassing. He was spotted by two United Airlines employees and when asked to show ID. He showed a badge that was reported missing by an employee back in October. Singh told police that he was afraid to fly due to the pandemic, but he wouldn't say why he came to Chicago from California in the first place. Welcome back. It is being called, quote, diplomatic vandalism, and many are pointing their fingers at America after a move by the Trump administration they claim will make the world's worst humanitarian crisis even harder to fix. Millions in Yemen are at or near the brink of starvation, and now many aid groups might not be allowed to help feed the hungry. Ian Panel explains. Hussein al Kalani was born into this blighted land four months ago. Four months old, and every single day, his parents must fight to keep him alive. Ah! It's difficult to watch, but Hussein needs help. So weak, he can no longer breastfeed. So hungry that he gnaws at his hand endlessly. The only diapers he has were the ones bought by our cameraman. Hussein suffered from malnutrition since he was born. They tell me to take him to the malnutrition clinic in Sana, but I don't have any way to get him there. As you can see, I'm a poor person who owns nothing. The family was made homeless by Yemen's war. They now live amidst the dust and filth of a camp for some of the hundreds of thousands uprooted by the conflict. When I see him sick like this, it breaks my soul. With just one food basket every three months from the World Food Programme to live on, Hussein's parents must choose between feeding their family or selling it for medicine for their son. There's no clinic here, but the baby boy desperately needs help, so our team drive the family to a neighbouring camp where there is a small medical centre. While the world's looked the other way, more than half the population of Yemen has edged ever closer to the brink of starvation. Yemen's been declared the world's worst humanitarian crisis by the United Nations. Almost six years of war has devastated the country, and half the population, more than 15 million people, is on the brink of starvation. Two out of every three people here can't afford to buy food. We saw this firsthand when we visited Yemen with the New York-based International Rescue Committee in 2018. The doctor is essentially measuring the circumference of the top of her arm around what is her bicep. We can see here it's just crossed over into the red, which is severely malnourished. Yemen's been gripped by a violent conflict since 2015. On one side, government forces backed by Saudi Arabia and the Emirates. On the other, Houthi rebels backed by Iran accused of attacking the country's main airport recently. Both accused of war crimes, but it's Saudi fighter jets, controversially supported by American intelligence and bombs, that have repeatedly struck civilians. <laughs> And now, in one of the final acts of the Trump administration, Ansar Allah, or the Houthi rebels, will be designated as a terrorist organization from tomorrow. In a statement, Secretary Pompeo saying this will confront terrorist activity and terrorism by Ansar Allah, a deadly Iran-backed militia group. But the UN 
and all major aid agencies fear it could be disastrous, forcing them to limit their work in Houthi-controlled areas where 80% of Yemenis live or risk prosecution by the US government. There's been rare bipartisan condemnation of this move. This is a death sentence for millions of Yemenis because they are, over the course of the next several weeks, going to run out of food and are going to starve to death. It's that simple. Uh, and the fact that the Trump administration went forward with this designation, um, knowing that that would be the consequence, um, is you know, absolutely uh, devastating. It's heartbreaking. It's mind-blowing. The International Rescue Committee has been providing vital, life-saving work on the ground in Yemen for years. They now fear this move by the Trump administration could undo that. We see it as something that will create barriers such that it will be nearly impossible for us to effectively and efficiently deliver aid to those in need. And that would be a crisis anywhere. But in Yemen, it is a catastrophe. So time is running out for four-month-old Hussein. At the clinic, he's measured and weighed. He's just 2.2 kilograms, just over four and a half pounds. The average weight of a four-month-old in America is near 15 pounds. The challenge for the new president couldn't be more stark. If Joe Biden reverses this designation, he risks being accused of being soft on terrorists and Iran and upsetting Israel and allies in the Gulf. But the risks of doing nothing are greater. <laughs> Hussein's life may depend on what President Biden decides to do in Yemen. Ian Panel for ABC News Live. Our thanks to Ian for that. And as we just saw, finding food is a struggle for millions of children. And while hunger is a growing concern here in the U.S. as well, many parents are now confronting another problem and one without such life or death consequences. Certainly COVID has canceled a lot, leading some to a digital dependence and skyrocketing screen time. Becky Worley has more. Like many kids, 14-year-old James Reichert of Boulder, Colorado, used to having an active schedule of basketball, piano, and biking, is now all in on his devices. I started playing my Xbox way more and turned to my phone to communicate with my friends. But things hit a breaking point when his dad realized how much time was being spent just playing one device. What concerned me the most was when I saw one week, it was literally 40 hours. And it hit me that... This is like a full-time job. Didn't feel like 40 hours playing with my friends the whole time. We're talking. So limits were placed. That spike in use, not unique. The screen time monitoring application Custodia releasing data showing kids' device usage has doubled since a year ago. One example, YouTube now averaging 97 minutes a day per user, double the viewing time from 2019. An online game Roblox, a huge hit with the 9 to 12-year-old set, now reporting over 31 million players, explosive growth up 82% since last year. The Reichert's rethinking what they can do in this difficult time. All steps toward the time when normal life resumes. Early in the pandemic, um, I repeatedly urged parents uh, not to be unduly concerned about their children's overuse of screens. But we've now reached a point where it's almost a year. We start now to try to reintroduce some level of guardrails around children's media use. Trying to get them to turn those screens off. Our thanks to Becky for that. And when we come back, what Dr. King may have thought about these turbulent times, according to his namesake and son. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. Petition, the number one daytime talk show, and number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Marvel Studios' first series has arrived on Disney+. Plus. You're one of the Avengers. Are you here to help us? 
This is our home. Then let's fight for it. Experience Marvel Studios' WandaVision. First two episodes now streaming, only on Disney+. Plus. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. What you're seeing right now, this is part of the eye wall. This procession of migrants goes back two miles. There is going to be catastrophic damage. This fire has made a run. You can see those flames shooting up into the sky. We are on the jam-packed red carpet. Let's do it right, guys. So this is the fourth week end of protest. <laughs> Watch NBC News on location for Facebook Watch. Breaking news, context, analysis. With today's extraordinary news cycle. Now is the perfect time for ABC News Live. A streaming news game changer. The time is now for ABC News Live. Get it, streaming everywhere. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. Welcome back. Today, we, of course, pause to celebrate a man who was revered as one of the greatest Americans in our history, a man who led this country closer to its promise of liberty and justice for all. Martin Luther King Jr. was just 39 years old when he was assassinated in 1968, but his legacy clearly lives on. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. Because of that hopeful vision, because of Dr. King's moral imagination, barricades began to fall and bigotry began to fade. New doors of opportunity swung open for an entire generation. Our generation will change the world. We are one voice, we are one people. institutional change. We want this whole system torn down. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. If I could dream like Dr. King, I would dream that no one would be afraid when they look at me. Dr. King said it best. If we don't learn to live together as friends. We die as fools. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. May these words give us the power to stand up for righteousness and stand up for justice and stand up for truth and know that even as we stand up, we don't stand alone. But while I may be the first woman in this office, I will not be the last. When the world does not have an example of love, we must be that example. Let there be peace and equality on earth, and let it begin with us. Fitting now that we are joined at this moment to discuss just how far we've come, but also how far we have left to go, is another part of MLK's legacy. His son, Martin Luther King III. Sir, thank you so much for being with us on this day. Uh, in your mother's memoir, Coretta Scott King admitted to having some reservations about naming you after your father because of the possible, quote, burdens that that might bring. What has it been like for you to grow up without your father, but with his powerful name and and what thoughts and emotions go through your mind on this day particularly during a moment in time like the one that we're currently in you know I think so much goes through my my mind and head at this particular moment as we are on the brink of the inauguration of the next president uh, that 81 million Americans came together and elected president-elect uh, Joe Biden and the first black woman, uh, Vice President Kamala Harris. 
Uh, so while we are going through great turmoil, it seems internally, uh, there always is progress uh, that is being made. In the age of social media, people love quoting your dad as an example of achieving change in a, a peaceful manner. You had several uh, Republicans on the floor of the House last week as they debated impeachment who uh, quoted your dad. But of course, the civil rights era was anything but civil. Uh, your father also strongly warned against what he called the white moderate at the time in his famous letter from a Birmingham jail, which he wrote uh, while detained due to protesting the mistreatment of blacks. An expert of that excerpt of that letter reads uh, in part, I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in his stride toward freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I cannot agree with your methods of direct action, who paternalistically believes he can set the timetable for another man's freedom. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. Do you think that one of the greatest stumbling blocks is in this day, people of various shades in our society who have overdosed on uh, what I'll call the highly addictive drug of gradualism? Well, I, I still think that is, is certainly a problem. But it is not a problem cannot, that, that cannot be overcome. I think when you look at the masses of young people today, when we saw the demonstrations back in the summer, which in every state in our nation, we had civil rights demonstrations with people holding signs that say Black Lives Matter. A lot of those demonstrations, a significant number of them were white demonstrators. So obviously there is a tide and a shift that is coming. And once you acknowledge a problem, then you can address it. For so long, we've acted as if racism was not real and it, we were beyond it. Many people thought that after President Obama, oh, it was a post-racial period. Well, many in communities of color understood that was just not the case. Despite many of the hurdles and uprisings of the last year, we have seen some progress and change. As you noted, Vice President-elect Kamala Harris will be sworn in this week, and of course, the state of Georgia elected its first black senator. Where do you plan to watch the inauguration on Wednesday? And also, what was your reaction when you found out that the pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church, a, a place of such powerful significance for your family, that he had won? So where I'll be watching is, of course, uh, uh, because of the pandemic here in Atlanta, normally I would have loved to have been at the inauguration, uh, but the pandemic has caused us to all as, uh, as uh, national citizens reevaluate. Uh, is it re as it relates to uh, Dr. Warnock and uh, my feelings about uh, his victory, it was absolutely phenomenal. And the fact of the matter is Georgians came together, black and white uh, and Latino and Jewish and Asian uh, Americans, uh, young and old, uh, to help elect Reverend Warnock and John Ossoff. And uh, what is so important, Reverend Warnock for 15 years has been pastoring in this community at Ebenezer. And so it's interesting not just to, to talk uh, about what can become, but to now be in the United States Senate to help enact uh, what he's been talking about. In your dad's uh, I Have a Dream speech, he really laid out a detailed list of all that is necessary to come into fruition if America is to become a great nation. That was, of course, 1963. Is it your belief that in the subsequent nearly six decades that America has achieved that status as great? Absolutely not. Uh, and that does not mean that progress has not been made. It just means that we are nowhere near where we need to be. My father wanted to eradicate what he called were the triple evils of poverty, racism, and he said militarism, which I sort of changed to violence. We've got to learn how to turn to each other and stop turning on each other. Uh, that's what my father and my mother would want to see in this nation. And that's the capacity that we have the ability to do. We have the ability to do most anything. We just have not yet identified the will. 
And lastly, you have to ask about your daughter, Yolanda Renee, who has clearly taken after her late grandfather as an impactful orator with a clear vision of the future, proclaiming that her generation will be the generation that will fulfill Dr. Martin Luther King's dream. What are your thoughts and hopes about the younger generation getting the nation across the finish line of equality? Well, you know, there is no question that she has stated and challenged her generation to do their jobs. My mom used to say that every generation has to earn its keep. My hope is that we as a collective today uh, can begin that, that work so that it does not have to be so hard for them. It should not be hard for every uh, generation. It should get easier. But what I know is if we're not able to complete this work, she and her generation are up and ready and say, say they're going to do it. And I have no doubt about it. All right. Great to hear from you and talk to you today. We thank you so much for your time. Martin Luther King III. Thank you. That is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day of stop stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. And we leave you now with our image of the day, those flags on the National Mall in honor of the hundreds of thousands who have lost their lives to COVID in this country.